You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Kit Frick on the show with me today. She has an amazing new book. It's called I Killed Zoe Spanos. And let me tell you what, Kit, I absolutely love this book. Um, You know, for one, uh, you know, it's about a podcaster and, you know, I'm a podcaster. And so what's not to love about that? Um, But, you know, what? What a great read. Um, So anyway, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Hank. I'm delighted to hear that. Absolutely. There's so much I want to talk to you about this book. Um, But before we do, uh, we always begin the show with the same question. And that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Ooh, my first memory. Well, I started writing pretty young. I was writing throughout grade school and high school, but I wasn't really thinking of writing from a storytelling perspective at that point. It was a very private, personal uh, sort of self-expression exercise. I wouldn't show my writing to anyone. So it wasn't really until I got to college and I took my first writing workshop that that switch flipped for me and I began to think of writing as something to share with others and a method of storytelling. So really that that very first writing class that I took um, was, I think, the key that unlocked thinking of writing as storytelling. And then I was totally hooked from there on out. <laughs> were you a, a bookish kid? Uh, you know, did were you the the kind of kid that walked around with a book? with you all the time and just completely get lost in stories? I was definitely an avid reader as a child. Um, I I grew up with parents that really valued reading to me, and then I would read to them once I, uh, once I learned to read. So we had a lot of reading out loud in my family as um, a form of entertainment, and then, yes, I was always reading on my own. I mean, I wasn't necessarily the kid that would carry a book around to a social engagement, but I was I was always reading. I loved the Babysitter's Club series <laughs> in grade school, um, as I think did so many um, kids of my age. And I remember getting really hooked into that series and into so, so many other books. I remember the Babysitter's Club, uh, you know, being a thing, um, you know, when I was a teenager or, or younger, maybe. And then there was a, a recent announcement that maybe there's going to be a Netflix series yes. based on that. And yeah, my I... daughters just totally freaked out and flipped over <laughs> that. And and I was like, oh, well, that's a the Babysitter's Club is still a thing. How about that? I um, know. I haven't <laughs> dipped into it yet, but it's definitely on my queue. Right, right. So amazing. Um, so, Kit, you, you said you had this sort of awakening to storytelling. Um, my words, not yours, but um, this thing that happened around the time that you started college where it became something that was more than just personal uh, expression for you and 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 more than just a way to record your thoughts or but, you know, that maybe this is. A, a transcendental sort of thing that this was something that you could share with the world. Do, do you, um, can you kind of put your finger on what happened then? Well, I had first come to storytelling really through theater. That was what I was really involved in, in middle school and high school. So I was a creative kid and I did love storytelling through being involved in both my high school theater and community theater. 
And when I got to college, I had thought that maybe I would study both. And the college that I went to was very uh, like no majors, kind of hippie curriculum, which was a great fit for me. Um, But there were restrictions in terms of arts classes in your first year there, you could only take arts classes in one discipline at a time to make sure you were also taking enough academic courses. So I had to make this choice my first year between taking a writing workshop and what was called a theater third, where it was a third of your schedule in a variety of theater classes. And so my thinking was I would sign up for the writing workshop and then I would do theater extracurricularly because I could always audition for plays and still be involved in the theater community and then I'd decide going from there and then I just didn't audition for any plays. I got so sucked into the writing community on campus and I really I think I had already before I got to college even though I probably wasn't admitting it to myself at the time, but I probably had started to already think that a career in theater was going to be really difficult. And jokes on me because a career as a writer isn't any easier, but (laughs) (laughs) but there was, it's much less um, physical and visible. And there were Things that as a body conscious teenager, I didn't have to worry about as a writer. That was something that was on my mind as someone going into theater potentially. So I think there were all sorts of things going on that had to do with adolescent development at that stage, as well as creative development. Um, But once I got comfortable with sharing my writing, with others, I really dove into it as a creative form. And let me tell you, taking a workshop is quite a way to first dip your toes into sharing your writing with other folks, because you're not just sharing it with them, but you're sitting there silently while a room full of peers critique your work. And so it was really, you know, just plunging in off you know, the deep end. And um, there was definitely a um, sort of a rude awakening that my writing wasn't perfect through that experience. But also there was praise and encouragement from my professor and from peers. And so that inspired me to keep going and keep working on my craft. And uh, I learned to filter criticism the way you do when you get feedback, whether it's through a workshop setting or through getting feedback from a writing group or critique partners. You sort of learn who in the room really gets what you're doing and who you can really learn from the most. And you also learn, you know, what praise to really value and what might be better filtered out. And so there were all sorts of things that I was learning about, about taking feedback and revision and creative expression and all of those things. And I really thrived on it. Noveler is the best way to write a novel. Why? Quite simply because we've made it the easiest place to do it. Writing a novel is hard enough. Noveler takes care of all the logistical bits of writing a novel, just leaving that small matter of the words to you. It's a clean, beautiful writing interface with writing analytics, goals and streaks, advanced grammar checking, version control, day, evening, and night modes, and many other features designed to take all the stress out of writing. Tell us what you need and we'll build it. Together, we'll build a better tool. With a design-led approach, all the right tools that you need Noveler saves all your words constantly, allows you to manage and order your novel easily. It's accessible from any device, desktop or mobile. It syncs to Google Drive and Dropbox. It allows exports in various formats, including ebook and more. It also has nice touches like allowing you to write both offline and online, unique for a web-based platform. Everyone needs help with their writing from inspiration through to grammar checking, so we're doing our best 
to provide that support. We integrate that support directly into Noveler. Our advanced grammar checker powered by Pro Writing Aid does everything from spell check to style advice. Our writing courses include the incredible Tim Clare's Couch to ADK. We're really excited to offer all Author Stories listeners 30% off Noveler for a whole year. And it doesn't matter if you choose to sign up for the monthly or annual plan. You'll get 30% off. All you need to do is use the discount code HANK when you sign up. Noveler, N-O-V-L-R. That's noveler.org. Kit, I, I know a lot of writers. I, I've got to meet lots and lots of people doing this podcast. Um, I also know a lot of theater people. Um, uh, my son, well, all of my kids, but my oldest son um, is uh, is a theater director. Uh, he, he's also oh, an English He's also an English teacher, um, but there's there seems to be you know a, an interesting intersection between um, people that um, that are involved in the visual arts in the in in, in acting uh, and people that that um, that write as well. Um, do you notice an intersection there? Or is it you know I've met some writers who are just very frustrated. Uh, actors and directors, <laughs> uh, because, you know, as a writer, you get to control the whole process. Um, y- you are all of those things. And and, you know, there's there's something very creative about the collaborations that happen in theater. Um, but uh, h- how do you contrast or, or compare theater with writing and what things do you get to do as a writer um, that maybe you couldn't do? Is that, or, or maybe what things do you miss, you know, as a writer that that you could do in theater? Yeah, I think that's a very astute observation that there is such an intersection between theater people and writer people. Um, I mean, I can think off the top of my head in my debut group, which was uh, 2018, my first novel came out. And so there was, you know, a group of us that were writing young adult and middle grade fiction that were all debuting together that year that got to know each other. And off the top of my head, I can think of five other people that came from theater backgrounds before uh, going on to publish a novel. So, you know, I think like with all part of it is simply that they're part of the creative arts world and many of us that are creative people tend to find uh, at different points in our lives um, a uh, a value in different art forms. Um, So part of it is that. And I think also there you had asked about, uh, you know, what you can do in one versus the other um, and what I might miss. And Certainly what I missed, and more so when I was younger than now, but I think the thing that I loved the most about theater as a teenager, beyond, of course, just being on stage, which I clearly liked, um, but it was the community aspect of it. I had this, um, the it was called the Pittsburgh Playhouse, and they did... Uh, big uh, kids and adolescent um, community theater program that was classes and then also plays. And there was a big summer program that I did every summer where you were there every day, five days a week, doing um, a whole day long course of various classes and then also rehearsing for a play at the end of the summer. And the bonds that I formed with the kids that were in my community theater group and then also my high school theater group that I did were some of the strongest in um in my teenage years and there's you know there's just something special about being involved in theater in the same way that I imagine kids that are athletes have that sort of sense of community with their teammates if they're doing sports seriously And in writing, you know, as I don't have to tell you or probably anyone listening to this podcast, so much of it is a solitary pursuit. And so, you know, that was very different once I sort of switched my focus to writing. But 
I did find, I, I was very lucky to go to a college that had this really strong creative writing program. And so there was still a sense of community, even though it wasn't through the art form itself in terms of creation. Um, but there were so many other writers on campus and so many things to do outside of classes that were writing focused. And we had a couple of really great professors. I went to college right outside of New York City and they would take us into the city to go to writing events. I remember going to a poetry slam at the New Yorican, which was just blew my mind because it was so different from what I was doing writing wise. But, um, but so there was still that sense of community. And now at various stages of my adult life, I have found that in different ways. Um, I, Went on to get an MFA several years out of college. So I had that community group. And then I mentioned my debut group. And now a couple years on, some of my closest writer friends are writers that I, you know, came up with during that uh, debut experience. So it's just different ways of finding a community. One thing that I've noticed uh, a contrast in uh, theater versus writing, or I've, I've got some friends that are stand-up comics, um, and and they've, uh, you know, commented similar things, is that when when you're doing something on the stage, you get immediate feedback from the audience. Uh, mm. When when you're writing, you it's it's just you. It's you're you're depending on your own feedback. And you know, then at some point in the process, some people will share some of their writing with with a writing group, um, like you mentioned, or with an editor, or you know, with some trusted source. And there's a little bit of feedback there. Um, but for the most part, m most people don't get real feedback on the totality of the story until it's finished, until you've invested 80, 90, 100, 110,000 words into something. Um, and, and then it goes out to the world that that's kind of a very different feedback loop, um, you know, process. It is. And the funny thing about it is that in writing, when, once you're working as a published writer, one of the most common pieces of advice that I got, um, you know, before I had actually published my debut, See All the Stars, but it was coming out, was to avoid reviews from readers. Um, that was, you know, stay off Goodreads, don't read your Amazon reviews. <laughs> so I think there's a very different um, approach to feedback from the general public as an actor versus as a writer because you're right if you're a theater actor if you're on stage I mean there's no there's no avoiding the audience feedback they're there in the room with you and you're going to get a sense of is it a dead audience are they responding are they responding effusively like it's something that you really can't block out, or at least I don't remember being able to block that out when I was acting. Um, but as a writer, it's more about finding your sources of feedback. As you mentioned, you know, most of us have various relationships with other peer writers that we're swapping work with. But, uh, you know, again, this is going to vary writer to writer. I don't usually share work until I have a full draft, although that can be, you know, different situationally. Um, but then you're maybe working with your agent editorially. If you happen to have an agent who is editorial in their approach, you're working with your editor, certainly through at least a couple rounds of developmental feedback, but it's a very small group until you get to the stage where there are advanced copies and then you get sort of a mini, uh, surge of feedback from readers uh, when those arcs go out. And then, of course, you publish and hopefully lots of people are reading it. Um, but you have to choose as a writer how much of that feedback you want to ingest and when you want to. Um, I know some writers that just do not read any reader feedback in any form um, and others that can't stay off reading all of their Goodreads <laughs> reviews. And I mean, I'm somewhere in the middle. I, I do want to get 
feedback from readers because I want to know how people are responding to my work, but it's also not healthy to go into a sort of black hole of reading all sorts of reader reviews. So I don't tend to read reviews on, uh, you know, consumer sites like Goodreads or Amazon, but I love getting emails from readers and speaking with readers at um, festivals and conferences when we used to do those and hopefully we'll do those sometime again in the future. So it's about sorting what kind of, uh, what kind of feedback is going to be healthy and productive for you as a writer, I think. Well, and I think that the kind of feedback that you would get from an email or from a personal interaction uh, at a con or, or a convention, something like that, it is probably more truthful anyway. Um, uh, you, you know, people leave reviews and the the anonymity of, you know, being online, you know, brings out certain things in all of us. Um, but those those personal interactions, the deeper interactions, the email, the conversations at the convention, th- those are things that can actually be helpful in the long run. Scribophile is a respectful online writing workshop and writers community. Writers of all skill levels join to improve each other's work with thoughtful critiques, and by sharing their writing experiences. We're the writing group to join if you want to find beta readers, get the best feedback around, learn how to get published, and be a part of the friendliest and most successful writing workshop online. Improve your writing by receiving detailed critiques. Learn from a vast collection of free writing resources. Make lifelong friends in our busy community of writers. Writing is a solitary art, but that doesn't mean you have to be lonely. Lucky for you, there are thousands of writers on Scribophile every day, and we're a really friendly bunch. You've never seen a writing group like this one. Join Scribophile today at Scribophile.community. I think I think there's definitely truth in that for sure. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned a minute ago your your debut novel, See All the Stars. Um, looking back, um, Kit, you have had um, you have been storytelling for a long time. Uh, in in various forms and uh, you know working at your craft, uh, do you remember um, starting that book, see all the stars, and 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 was there a moment where you knew that this project was going to be different from all the other things that you had worked on and uh, and and done through the years? Was there something special in the beginning about this project, or was it just the next thing, you know, in line and and, and you just worked at it until it became what it was meant to be. I think it was a little bit of both. Um, See All the Stars was the second novel that I had written, but I had been writing poetry rather seriously for many years before that. So I had focused on writing poetry in both undergrad and then my MFA is in poetry. And so I had been working very seriously toward publication in poetry for a long time before I started writing fiction with any sort of seriousness. Um, So on the one hand, it was just the next project in a long progression of of writing um, throughout my, uh, you know, young adult and into my adult life. But In terms of fiction, I had written this novel that was also young adult. It was dystopian. And, you know, I had missed the memo that dystopian was was done. It was not selling anymore (laughs) Um, because I was not very looped in to the young adult community at all, except as a reader. I was reading young adult a lot because I missed it as a teenager. Young adult didn't exist as an age category when I was a teenager. Um, There were, of course, some books being written for teens. And I remember a very small teen section in my local Borders and Barnes and Noble that was mostly horror. It was a lot of um, R.L. Stein and Christopher Pike were really, really big um, when I was a teen. But there wasn't the, you know, I was a teenager before Twilight came out. And that really was the start of YA as a publishing category. And so as an adult, I then discovered YA as a reader and read all of these books that I wished that I had had as a teenager. 
And I was really, really loving dystopian. I loved the Hunger Games. And so the first novel that I wrote was in that vein. It was set in Brooklyn, which is where I was living. I thought it was very cool. Um, And of course, it was highly derivative and probably was a great blessing to me that dystopian was dead because that novel had never had a, a... a shot, but um, I did prove to myself through the experience of writing it that in fact I could write a novel length work of fiction, which wasn't something that I was sure that I could do as someone who was used to writing in very short forms as a poet and occasional short story writer. And so I had a really fun time writing that book, even though it didn't go anywhere in terms of, uh, you know, a path toward publication. But by the time I had finished it, I had read much more broadly in YA. I was reading in all different genres and I was paying much more attention to the sort of business side of what was publishable, what was selling. And so when I developed the initial idea for See All the Stars, I wouldn't say that I knew that it was going to be something special or something different, but I at least felt confident that unlike beginning that dystopian project, I knew there was a space in YA for contemporary suspense. And I knew that it was something that if I executed it well, it could potentially lead toward Asian representation and then possibly publication. So I was more aware of the um, the young adult space at that point. How do you look at the difference in the the art form of, of poetry writing uh as opposed to prose writing, um, the you know the the mechanics of writing each of these are, are very different. The the emotional outcomes of them are are very different. Um, you know, poetry is is more compact. We uh, we expect the it, it to do very different things in the reader. Um, prose is is of course bigger and uh, more of a time investment, but it tends to to linger with the reader and we get invested in stories and we, we carry this book around with us for, you know, a week or two. And, um, you know, it's, it's a different investment, uh, from, from the reader's perspective, uh, from the writer's perspective, how do you approach these two different art forms? They are very different creatively as well as in, I think the, the reader experience, um, When I write poetry, I tend to handwrite a first draft. I will work on many, many drafts of revision of a very small, um, you know, chunk of words, to put it indelicately. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So there's a, there's kind of an, there's a, uh, how to describe it? There's like a, bolt of lightning immediate rush with a first draft of a poem and then there are many painstaking hours often over days and weeks and months of revision to get it to its final form and with fiction writing it's a completely different creative process I'm often spending two to three months just in the concept stage of discovering what this story might be, what's at its core, what is the what if question that is driving the scenario, who will the characters be, all those sorts of things before I even begin a first draft. So there is no, there might be a little lightning moment when it comes to a, uh, an idea that will spark the concept, but there isn't that like initial drafting rush. Drafting takes place over many, many weeks or months. And the, the amount of time it takes to write something novel length versus poem length is so different that I think it necessarily changes the creative process, even though I'm sure every poet and every novelist you speak to will say something different about their process, but it has to be very different for all of us that work in both forms. Absolutely. 
Your new book, I Killed Zoe Spanos. Uh, first off, let me tell you, Kit, this the look of this book is amazing. Uh, how about those uh, those blue painted edges uh, on the pages? That is that is phenomenal. Isn't it a beautiful, beautiful book? <laughs> it, it really yeah, is. I really, I really won the production and design lottery with this with this novel for sure. For sure, it, it is. It you know the the looks alone are are amazing. Um, the cover art is spectacular. Um, you know when when I first got it in the mail and I and I looked it over, uh, and then I read the premise of the book, I was I was hooked. Um, tell us a little bit about the uh, the premise, the the idea of the premise, and what were kind of all of these disparate elements that came together to make this. Um, you know, primordial stew that this book emerged <laughs> from. So I've been describing I Killed Zoe Spanos as young adult Rebecca set in the Hamptons with a podcast, um, <laughs> which I think is, is, is a pretty good, pretty good elevator pitch. Um, yeah, but I, I you, think so. <laughs> but to give you a little bit more, um, Anna, the protagonist, is 17. She comes out to the Hamptons for a summer nanny job. And by the end of that summer, and this is not a spoiler because it's revealed in the first chapter, the book is written, it's not chronological in its presentation. She walks into the police station in Heron Mills Village, the Hamptons town where she's nannying, and she confesses to playing a role in the death of Zoe Spanos, who is a local teen who went missing the prior New Year's Eve. But the problem is there's a lot that Anna doesn't remember about what happened, and her story has a lot of gaps in it. It's a little bit fishy, and... Another local teenager, Martina, who is the best friend of Zoe's little sister, Aster, produces a podcast to try to find out what really happened to Zoe Spanos when the police investigation winds down and she sees a need to step up to continue this investigation herself. So the question becomes, did Anna really kill Zoe? And either way, can Martina's podcast get to the bottom of what happened to Zoe Spanos? So you had this initial idea. When did all of the pieces really start coming together for you? Um, like how deep into the project or into thinking about the project were you when all of these elements started kind of coalescing and, and the story presented itself? This book was a little bit of a lightning in a bottle concept wise. Um, I had those initial pieces of Anna confessing to playing a role in the death of this missing teenager, that it would be in some way inspired by Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca, and that there would be a true crime podcast right from the beginning. Um, I had this driving question as a passionate Rebecca fan who had, I had reread the book um, for the, you know, manyth time. And <laughs> I had wondered to myself, what if Rebecca DeWinter had gone missing in the golden age of true crime podcasts that we are living in now? How would that have changed the way that story had played out for this, you know, affluent, well-respected woman in uh, the seaside village outside of London, if she had disappeared, you know, in 2020, what would that have looked like? And then let's make it, a, let's make it young adult and um, let's bring that podcast right into the novel. So all of those pieces were there from the start. Um, it's been of any of the novels that I've worked on, probably the quickest to come together from a concept standpoint. The uh, one thing that you notice right away when you start reading it is that uh, the book is written in first person or uh, it, in present tense. Um, it, it, it really gives it an immediacy. You know, you feel like you're right in the story. Um, did did you know right away that that this was uh, kind of the the viewpoint or the um, 
you know, how the narration needed to take place. Right. So the book is written, it's all in present tense, um, but it does take place in more than one timeline. And right. so Anna's Anna's story is that that summer that she's working in the Hamptons. That's the, the, the past timeline of the novel. But it does unfold for the reader in present tense because it's not Anna looking back on that summer. It is being told to the reader as if it is happening as we read it. The present timeline of the story is only three months later that fall, once she has confessed to manslaughter and concealing Zoe's body, and she is being held in juvenile detention awaiting trial. Um, in terms of choosing present tense, I, except for See All the Stars, which is written in alternating timelines that are between past and present, I think everything else I have written in YA is in present. Um, it is the tense that I am the most comfortable working in. And I think for first person narration and contemporary YA, it's certainly not the only choice, but it is a, it's a very common choice. So it's something that is in some way genre and age category specific. Um, what does change in this book is um, first and third. The um, the chapters that are in the, the now timeline in the fall are written in a third person point of view instead of the first person point of view that we get from Anna's. So we do get that um, shifting back and forth that helps helps guide the reader, I think, between the two timelines. Without giving away too much, um, because I, I'm there's so much um, about this book and so many twists and turns that it, it would be impossible to to talk about them all uh, on this podcast. But um, you know, we we know pretty soon uh, in the book what has happened, and it's not a who done it so much as a why done it, or uh, you know what what are what are the internal motivations and and what has has really happened. Um, how fun is it telling a story like that where you you play with the reader's emotions? And it's not a, a you know it's not a typical Agatha Christie type mystery, but plenty of mystery still the same. Yes. Yeah, so I think one of the one of the things that I loved about writing this book is that it is both a murder mystery. Um, we do learn in the first chapter that Zoe is not only missing, she is dead. Her body has been found. That much is known from the first few pages of the novel. But what we don't know is if the story that Anna tells police is true, partially true, complete fabrication, and what motivation she would have for lying if she is lying. So there are all these questions raised going in about the factuality of what is being said. And so it's both a murder mystery, but also a psychological suspense because the book delves into questions of memory and dark family secrets. So I had a lot of fun marrying those two uh, genres under the larger mystery thriller umbrella of psychological suspense and murder mystery in this book. And so that was very fun for me to uh, to bring together. You um, you love to occupy this this YA space. Um, all of your books uh, are um, labeled as such um, as a writer. Um, are, are you conscious of that or are there things that you do or don't do because it's YA? D does it simply mean because of the age of the, the protagonist? Um, can, what makes a, a book YA and, and how do you handle that as a writer? I think there are many different ways to answer this question, but for me, young adult is more about a point of view than it is about simply the ages of the characters. Because of course there are many novels that are written for and marketed toward adults that have children and teenagers as main characters, even point of view characters, and yet they're not 
for teenagers. So it's both about who your primary audience is. This is a book that is not only about teenagers, but it's written for teenagers first and foremost, although of course there was a large crossover audience to adult when it comes to YA, I think especially in thrillers. Um, you know, there are going to be a lot of adults that pick up and hopefully love this book, but they are not my primary audience. Um, but I'm I'm working on a novel right now that I've been working on for quite a while that is um, what I hope will be my first novel for adults. And it also involves teen characters. So this is something that I've been thinking about quite a lot from a creative standpoint. The teenagers that I'm writing in this work in progress novel are very much teenagers that I'm writing about as opposed to writing for in the way that I'm doing in my young adult novels. So I think it has to do a lot with the point of view of your characters more so than just their age. Gotcha. The new book is called I Killed Zoe Spanos. Um, it's available everywhere now. I'm going to put links to it in the show notes uh, of this episode uh, it's out available in Kindle edition, uh, hardcover, and audiobook. Um, I haven't listened to the audiobook yet, Kit, but I can just imagine how amazing this probably comes across as audio. It is amazing. Um, I am, th- as we record this, this novel only released about a week ago. And so I am only partway through my first full listen of the audiobook, although I had gotten to hear clips in progress, which was very cool. But um, it's a full cast recording. I think there are about 11 voice actors that worked on this audiobook. And the podcast chapters sound like a real true crime podcast. There is music, there are multiple voices. It is just absolutely spectacular in its production. So um, yes, I highly recommend a listen to the audiobook, especially if you are a avid podcast listener. Absolutely. We'll put links to all of that in the show notes where you can easily access it. Um, Kit, if people are just learning about you and want to dig into all the great stuff that you do, uh, where can they find you online? I'm very easy to find online. My website is kitfrick.com. I am at kitfrick on Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest. And I am at kitfrick author on Facebook. Excellent. We'll put links to all that where people can find you. Uh, Kit, this has been so much fun chatting. I um, highly recommend the new book, I Killed Zoe Spanos. Pick it up today. Thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Hank. World Anvil is a browser-based world-building platform designed for all world builders, writers and novelists, dungeon masters, game developers, and everyone else. World Anvil keeps your world settings safe and organized, helps you find your characters, locations, plots, timelines, and maps quickly and easily as you write. Then, if you choose, you can showcase your amazing world building to the world, beautifully and interactively, to keep your readers engaged. You can even use our professional tier to build your career selling access to behind the scenes content your readers will love and growing your community. Build your world setting in any genre with over 25 custom built world building templates, complete with prompts to inspire your creativity. Allow your readers to explore the public parts of your world in an innovative new way with interactive maps, timelines, and wiki style articles. Give special access to co-authors, beta readers, customers, or patrons to see exclusive behind-the-scenes content. There's a free version to get started with, with all of the major features. Guild membership offers you a host of extra options, including comprehensive privacy settings, co-authors, presentation options, and so much more. Join our community of over 250,000 world builders, including professional authors, Take part in competitions and learn more about world building at this fantastic online community. Use the coupon code HANK to get 20% off all 6 and 12 month subscriptions. WorldAnvil.com. I'm a recent convert and I know you will be too.